going to get started. Let's go ahead and get started. Father, in the name of Jesus, have a chance to pray. We thank you for this opportunity to come and gather. We are thankful for your son, Jesus Christ. We are thank you, uh, thankful, Father, for life, health, and strength. Be with us tonight as we study your word. Speak something to us, a word of encouragement. Um, we know that as we study your word, Lord God, we find out things, truths in there, Lord God, that apply to our lives. So I just ask that you come right now, um, be with us during this time of study. Help us reveal to us what you have us to know, Lord God. And for all of those who may watch at a later time, just strengthen them, Lord God, in their faith. I ask it in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. And amen. Again, everybody, good evening to you. Um, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Ephesians chapter 2. This is your first time joining us. We, we've been in a study in the book of Ephesians. Uh, and tonight we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. And I'm going to try to get through chapter 3 as well so that I can get back and jump into chapter four. So tonight we're looking at Ephesians chapter two. We're gonna be looking at verses 11 through 22, as well as uh, uh, chapter three. Um, and, and I'll kind of explain to that once we get to that. I, I don't think that we need to spend, I, I think chapter three reinforces chapter two. So um, that's what we're gonna be looking at tonight. Tonight, I really wanna kind of talk to you from the thought of our position in Christ. That's that's kind of what, really what I'm trying to drive through in the text that we're looking at tonight, our position in Christ. Hey there, Mother Jones, Agnes, good evening. Uh, Lady Nona, good evening to you. Welcome. So what we're looking at tonight is, is our position in Christ, who we are in Christ. Um, a, a few weeks ago, just as we get started, a few weeks ago, my son, TJ, came to me and uh, he was down a little bit, y'all. And he said um, that someone at his school, one of the little children at his school, a child there, said to him that he wasn't very smart. And he was down a little bit about it. And I said, well, you know, son, why did the person say that you weren't very smart? And first he said, well, I don't know. But then he said, well, he said I wasn't very smart because um, he was able to figure out how to do the Rubik's Cube. I don't know if y'all remember that little toy that they would turn and so forth. And TJ hadn't quite figured it out. And so he, he said that he was smarter than TJ because he was able to figure it out. And so this, this young little boy felt that he was um, superior in intelligence because he could do a Rubik's Cube. And after I calmed myself down uh, and, and from getting upset as a father, um, I, I kind of tried to reinforce to TJ and encourage him, look, man, you make straight A's in school. You know, Rubik Cube is not everything. But even then, after that, I felt impressed by the Lord to kind of encourage him of who he is. He goes to a predominantly um, uh, white school, uh, and generally he's like one or a few minorities in the class. And sometimes, you know, depending on your environment, you can take those things hard. But I, I felt it was my position as his father to not only tell him that he was smart because he was a Jones, uh, <laughs> and he got the genes of his mom and his daddy, but also just to encourage him in the Lord of who he is. And I, I just started encouraging him, hey man, you know, the Bible says that you have the mind of Christ. You know, the Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't ever let someone try to put you down or make you feel in any kind of way that you are inferior. God made you and designed you exactly the way how he wanted you to be that you can do all things to Christ who strengthens you, you know? And I just I just kept encouraging him about who he was in the Lord and that he wasn't what people said he was, but he was who God said he was. And by the time he got done, y'all, he left and he was encouraged. He, had, he felt he had his swag back. He felt that he was built up in the Lord. Um, and he felt leaving good, or he felt when he left feeling good because he was encouraged of who he was in the Lord. And so my question to you tonight, even as we start looking at this text, is do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know who you are in Christ? And what I find is, is that many times if you don't know who you are, chances are you, gen you tend to have a higher view of yourself than you ought to or you tend to have a lower view of yourself than you need to. And I believe that this is something that Paul wants to draw our attention tonight 
is who are we in Christ? There are many people right now in the church today who are behaving, I think, um, ungodly. Mm -hmm. You know, they have attitudes towards other believers in the body that just is not godly. They have attitudes about who they are and, 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 and you know, just these, these superior attitudes right now, which really is not what Christ died for. And so that's what I want to talk to you about tonight is it's who the Bible says that we are in Christ. That's what I believe Paul would want us to know. So first, if you got your Bibles, Ephesians chapter two, just beginning there at verse 11, we're going to jump into it again. We're going to get through the end of chapter two and chapter three tonight. And then we're going to jump into chapter four because there's a lot in chapter four that I want us to cover. So first, in chapter two, beginning at verse 11, Paul talks to us about our position, our position before God, before we came to Christ. And if you look there in Ephesians chapter two, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. So just remember, there's many different versions out there that you can read. They may read a little different. Some emphasize different words, but I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible tonight. And beginning in verse 11, hear what it reads. It first talks about our position before God, before we came to Christ. It reads, so then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised or by the Jews who were circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. Verse 12, at that time you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. So Paul here is describing our position before God, before we came to Christ. And you notice a key word there, at least in the Christian Standard Bible, is were. You were. Were is a past tense word. It describes something that was in the past or it describes something that has changed, right? So Paul says that we were separate from Christ. You see that? So Paul says, you know, at that time you were without Christ or you were separated from Christ. We had no relationship with Christ. Before we came to know Jesus Christ, we had no relationship with the Savior. We had no chance of becoming saved. We had no relationship with him at all. It says before we came to know him, we were excluded from the citizenship in Israel. We were excluded. That means that we were excluded from being a member of God's chosen people. Before we came to Christ, y'all, we, we, you know what a Gentile is, right? A Gentile is a non-Jew. <laughs> and so before we came to Christ, we were excluded from being a member of God's chosen people because we weren't a Jew. We were excluded from citizenship in Israel or excluded from citizenship into God's family there, God's people. It says that we were foreigners to the covenants of God's promise. So before we came to Christ, um, all of the covenants and the promises that God had made didn't apply to us. Um, if you remember all of the promises that God made to Abraham, those covenants, David and so forth, Mosaic covenants, I mean, all of those things were to the Jews. They were to Abraham and his seed, right? And because we weren't Jews, we were Gentiles, None of those things applied to us before Christ. Uh, we were excluded. We were foreigners, strangers to the covenants. We didn't know any, even anything about them. It says we were without hope. So before we came to Christ, you know, and this gets back to some of the things to where people say that uh, there may be other ways to Christ. Well, Paul says, well, before we came to Christ, we had no hope. There was no hope. There was no chance of salvation. We were the walking dead. We were destined on our way to hell. This is the way we, this was our position before we came to Christ and we were without God. If you see that there, we didn't know God. We didn't have a relationship with him. That was our position before we came to Christ. We were separated from him. We didn't have any relationship. We didn't have any access to the covenants. Anything that was good, we were separated from that. But I want you to notice what verse 13 says. If you have your Bible, Ephesians chapter two, notice what it says. My translation what? says, but now. But now, hallelujah. <laughs> Do y'all see that? I, I don't know what your translation, King James, whatever you're reading, but mine says, but now. Amen. And but now means that something has changed. <laughs> that
that something was something, but, but now it's different, right? So he described where we were, our position before God, before we came to Christ. But notice what he says in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. So he says, we once were separated far away from God, but notice what he says. He says, but in Christ Jesus, do you see that there? Mm -hmm. In Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near Amen. to God by the blood of Christ. So he says that the way we become near to God is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. I, I emphasize that because, you know, these debates about how a person can be saved without Christ, I don't understand because Paul says again here, just in, when you read your Bible, make sure you pay attention to stuff like that. Paul says again that, but now in Christ Jesus or through Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near, right? That the way how you become near is through Christ Jesus, right? So what is Paul saying? He's saying before we came to God or before, before we came to God through Christ, Gentiles or non-Jews were far away from God. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we didn't know him. Uh, if you remember, the only way to know God or come near to God was through the Jews. <laughs> oh boy, I hope you get this. Be before we came to Christ, the only way that you could come close to God or know God or do anything, you had to go through the Jews, uh -huh. right? Because the Jewish people were the ones through whom which God spoke to. Uh -huh. The uh -huh. Jewish people were the ones who had the relationship with God. Uh -huh. The Jewish people were the ones who had the law of God. Uh -huh. The Jewish people were the ones who had the sacrifices to where you would cover your sins until Jesus Christ came. The Jewish people were the ones who had the prophets who, who proclaimed the word of God and told us about God. And we got everything that we know from the Jews, right? Mm -hmm. And so the Bible says that before Jesus Christ, we as Gentiles had no access to God. We were far away from him. Mm -hmm. But now something has changed. Oh, he says, but now something has changed. The, the relationship has changed. That we used, who used to be so far off and didn't have access to God, we who used to have to come to the Jews to even try to approach God, but now that's changed. Because in Christ Jesus, we who were far have now been brought near to God. So it's just as the Jews were close to God and had relationship with us, we Gentiles now... Our position has now changed to where we're close, just like the Jews are. Amen. Amen. Somebody ought to say amen on that one. Mm -hmm. So in Christ Jesus, the first thing he tells us is that in Christ Jesus, we've been brought near. But the second thing he tells us is that in Christ, all believers have been made one. And I think this is important. In Christ, or because of Christ, all believers have now been made one. Look at verse 14. It says, for he, speaking of Christ himself, is our peace, Amen. who has made, watch this, the two groups, one. this is in the Christian Standard Bible, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Hmm. Do y'all see that there? See, this is what I was talking about on Sunday about studying your Bible and making sure that you don't read over that and glance over that. Like you have to meditate on that. But notice what he says, who has made the two groups one. Mm -hmm. What two groups is he talking about? What groups is he talking about? He's referring to the Jewish group of believers, mm -hmm. the Jewish Christians, and the Gentile believers or the, or the, or the uh, Gentile Christians. Mm -hmm. Listen. Mm -hmm. He made those two into one. Watch this. So in Christ Jesus, we are one. That means that the Jewish believers, that means that the African believers, that means that the Asian Christians, South American Christians, it doesn't matter who you are. If you are a believer in Christ, you are one. Amen. That means if you are white, that means if you are black. That means if you are tan, if you are yellow, 
Whatever your color is, if you are a believer in Christ, you are one. Watch this. Now, that doesn't mean that there are distinctions between them. You know, it doesn't mean that God no longer notices the distinctions between us, right? Because when you get to Revelation, he says that there were people from every nation and tribe and so forth. So there are still distinctions between the different people. But what rather what he's saying is, is that there is equality among Amen. them. Amen. I don't know if you all get this. So yeah. what, what he's saying is, is in Christ, all believers are one, listen, without one group being superior to another. Other. Mm -hmm. it, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, God. It, in Christ, one group is not superior to another group. In Christ, we are all one. Amen. That's what Romans chapter 10, verse 12 is saying. Romans chapter 10, write that down. Romans chapter 10, verse 12. Listen to what Paul says. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Watch this. So what he's saying is, is that in Christ Jesus, all believers are one and all believers are equal in the eyes of God. Now, why did God do this? Why would God make us all equal? What, what was the point? What was the problem? Why, why would God choose to make us all evil? Well, go back there and look at verse 14. It says he made us all equal to destroy the dividing wall of hostility mm -hmm. between the two. Mm -hmm. That's the Christian standard Bible. Now, your, your version may be a little different. But the reason why he had to make the Jews and the, and the Gentiles, non-Jews, one was to destroy the dividing wall of hostility that was between the two. Now, what, what does that mean? What, what does all that mean about the hostility and, and so forth? Well, you would have to do some study in your Bible, but the Jewish Christians, if you go back, the, the Jewish Christians, even though they were saved, they were still hostile towards Gentile believers. They, 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 there was a hostility between them. They, they had some issues with the Gentile believers. Why? And there's, there's many reasons why, but they, they had some hostility between them. Number one was because they weren't Jews. <laughs> and the Jews felt like because they were a chosen race, that they kind of had this superiority to the Gentiles. That because God spoke through them and God gave them the laws and that God, uh, uh, Jesus was a Jew and all the prophets and so forth, they, they had this superiority about them to where they tended to look down towards the Jews uh, or, or Gentiles. I don't know if you remember David when he was fighting Goliath. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? They, they just had no respect uh, for Gentiles in terms of their relationship with God. They, they felt that they had the higher relationship. So that caused conflicts and hostility between them. A second reason was that the Jews and the Christ, the Christian Jews and the Christian uh, Gentiles didn't get along was because the Christian Gentiles weren't circumcised. Mm -hmm. Watch this. And many, many of the Jews believed that in order for them to be saved, Gentiles needed to be circumcised just like they were circumcised. Some of you may remember this was a big issue in the beginning of the church that they felt, the Jews felt like, in order for you to be saved, you Gentiles, y'all cannot be saved if you're not circumcised. In fact, if you if you go back and read Acts chapter 15, to where they called all the apostles, all of them had to come together because there was such a big issue. So, for example, in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, it says, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. They were teaching the Christians Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 2, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So, so in, the, in the early church, there was hostility between the Christian Jews and the Christian Gentiles, and there was a hostility because the Christian Jews believe like if you weren't circumcised, you couldn't be saved. Another thing that 
and brought hostility between them was because the Christian Jews believed that they still had to follow the law, that they still had to follow the Torah. And, and they weren't happy when this council decided that you didn't, that, that, that the Jews didn't have, that the Gentiles didn't have to follow the law. You may say, Pastor, where is all this? You can find all this in Acts chapter 15, just go read it, right? And so this, this, these things, amongst other things, was causing a hostility between the two groups. The, the Jews didn't like the Gentiles or had a hostility towards them because they weren't keeping the law or they didn't have to keep the law or were told they didn't have to do all the festivals and all of the sacrifices and all the things that they had to do. They weren't circumcised and they weren't Jews. But watch this. Paul says that God didn't want this type of superiority in the church. The, the Jews felt like they were superior to the Gentiles because they were Jews, because they were circumcised, and because they kept the law, of which, y'all, if you want to find something funny, when you read Acts chapter 15, Paul says, why are we trying to put the law on these Gentiles, of which we ain't even keeping the law? Mm. <laughs> so you, you, you can go read that later. But, mm -hmm. but they thought they were superior because they did those things. But Paul says God didn't want this superior attitude in the church. So what did he do? He tore down the wall of hostility and destroyed it. That's what you see there in verse 15. Notice how he did it. In verse 15 of Ephesians chapter two, it says in the Christian Standard Bible, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace amen so i i, I don't know if you got that listen how, how did christ resolve the issue he, he had to bring peace between these two and it says he did it by abolishing in his flesh the enmity or the, that which was causing them to, to conflict, what was that? The Christian verse, the Christian standard Bible says, that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. So what Christ did was, the way how he, he brought peace was that he fulfilled the law himself uh -huh. and then paid the price for all of the violations of the law uh -huh. Uh -huh. that both the Jews and the Gentiles did. And when he did that, y'all, listen, he essentially squashed the issue because he squashed the issue on the Jews' part because they felt that they were superior because they kept the law, but he squashed it on their part because he paid the price for all of the sins that the Gentiles did by not keeping the law. But then he also satisfied the Jews or the Gentiles because by him sacrificing himself, they didn't have to keep the law, right? They they. The, he abolished the law as the means by which a person is saved, right? So, so here's the key. In Christ, the Jews are not superior to the Gentiles. That, that, that was the main thing. Mm -hmm. The Jews are not superior to the Gentiles. Watch this. And neither is any other group in Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus settled that. He didn't want this superiority in the church. He, he didn't want Jews feeling that they are superior because of the law, so he abolished the law. He, he fulfilled everything and took it out of the way. This is why, y'all, listen, here, here's, here, here's the issue. This is why racism has no place in the church. Amen. This is why Amen. a lot of these attitudes and stuff that you see going on within us as believers should not be in the church. Why? Because in Christ, we are all one. And there is no group that is superior to another. Mm -hmm. Y'all need to study mm -hmm. the Bible. Mm -hmm. That means white people are not superior to black. That means black people mm -hmm. is not superior to white people. Mm -hmm. That means black people are not superior to Tannish people, South American people. Why? Not in the body of Christ, mm -hmm. because in the body of Christ, mm -hmm. we are one. Amen. The Jewish Christians and the non Jewish. People, which includes everybody else, when Christ died, he made us one. That means that Christ is the thing that unites us and brings us together. That means in the church, 
it's Christ that keeps us together. It's not political parties. Amen. Oh, I ain't getting no amen. amens. Thank you, Shirley, for that amen. Uh, I ain't getting no amens in the chat, y'all. Uh, that means that what keeps us together and what unites us is not a political party. It's Christ. Amen. If you notice there, it says that he is our peace. Yes. That means no political yes. party is going to bring us peace. That means mm -hmm. that no political candidate should bring us peace. The only thing that's going to bring us peace is Christ. And that means all of these attitudes, many of us are rallying around a party rather than Christ. Mm. 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 Many of us are, are rallying around a person mm -hmm. or the wrong person, can I say that, mm -hmm. rather than Christ. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says the reason why we have all this hostility and the reason why we have all this drama is because we're not looking to Christ as our peace. Mm. Jesus Christ listen we are all united through christ and so the reason why we have all this drama and this chaos and these attitudes going back and forth is because rather than focusing in on christ and those things that he says that we are to do we're focusing in on all of these other people and all of these other things that people want but the unity for the that shouldn't be in the body of christ in the body of christ listen Christ is what unites us. Christ is what brings us peace. And, and, and until we get back to being united in him, listen, we may not agree on many different policies, but we should all agree on Christ. Hey. We may not agree hey. all on, uh, on many different legislative issues, but we should always stay firm on our belief and our, our relationship with Christ. Amen. And the more we do that, the more peace we have. Now, let me get move on. And, and the third thing he says there is that in Christ, we are also reconciled to God. So not only did Christ make peace between us mm -hmm. in the body of Christ, he is mm -hmm. what gives us peace. Mm -hmm. He resolves all of our issues in the mm -hmm. church is Christ. Mm -hmm. But Christ also reconciles us to God. You see there in verse 16, it says mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. he might reconcile mm -hmm. them both mm -hmm. to God in the one body through the cross, mm -hmm. thereby putting to death the enmity that which was between us. So Christ is the same person who brings or reconciles both of us, both the Christian Jew and the non-Christian Jew to God. He, he is the key to reconciling us both. So the Jews don't have a different path. We are all reconciled to God the same way. That's why we all are one in Christ. No one is any more special than another. The same way how the Gentile gets to Christ is the same way how the Jew gets to Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ is the key and the center point okay. to all of this. And through him, verse 16 says, we all have access to the same spirit or the same God through Jesus Christ. Amen. So, so who then are we in Christ? Let's, let's start wrapping up with this. Who then are we in Christ? Christ, what is our position in Christ? Look there in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Who does the Bible say that we are in Christ? In verse 19, it says that we are fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. So if you remember when we first started, it says that we were excluded from citizenship into the kingdom. But now Paul says that we are fellow citizens. Ephesians 2 19 says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. Amen. At least that's a Christian standard Bible. So we're no longer excluded from being members or, or, or members of the chosen race of God, but we are citizens. And not only citizens, he says we are citizens, fellow citizens with the saints. What does that mean? That means that all of the, the saints in the Bible, David and Moses and Abraham, all of the saints that we're talking about, we are just as much citizens as they are. We, we are just as much citizens of the kingdom of God as Moses is. Now, that is amazing because you are a Gentile. Yes, it is. Most of you watching me 
are non-Jewish. So for you to be even mentioned in the same word as the saints of God is huge. But the Bible says that in Christ, we are fellow citizens mm -hmm. in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? All of the promises, that means all of the promises that God made to the Jews and to everyone else, you and I now get. Mm. As fellow citizens, the same rights and privileges that, that other citizens get, we get too. Listen to what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 14. This, this is huge. This is important. I want you to understand it. Galatians 3, verse 14, write this down. Notice what it says. Galatians 3, 14 says, he, referring to Jesus, he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. <laughs> you got that. <laughs> Listen. As Gentiles, we had no right. The, the promise was made to Abraham and his seed. Jesus was a, a seed of Abraham coming down the line. Most of us are Jews. We had no right to the promises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says that he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentile. So you know what that means, baby? Everything that God promised to the Jews, all of those promises that he made apply to the Gentiles as well through Christ Jesus. That, that is now our position. We were excluded from the kingdom. We were excluded from all of these rights. But now, Christ, baby, our position has changed. Now who we are has changed. And now everything that God has made to the Jews has now come to us. The same promises. That's what he's saying. He said that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ. Galatians 3.14. Go back and read that. So first, we are now fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. Fellow citizens with all the saints, with all the Jews. The two have become one. But then he also says that we are members of his household. Mm -hmm. In verse 19, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow, fellow citizens citizen with the with saints the and of the members Lord. of the household of God. Amen. So, so no longer are we excluded from fellowship, but through Christ Jesus, we are now also members of God's household, meaning we are his children. Hmm. What a tremendous hmm. thing that is. Who, who we are in Christ. I say that all the time. You have to know who you are. You are a child of God. We read this in Ephesians chapter one, where he says that God has adopted us as his children. Amen. You and I are no longer far away from God. We are now children of God, close to God. Listen to what Galatians chapter three, verse 26 says. Just <clears throat> jot this down, Galatians chapter three, verse 26. It says, Galatians chapter three, watch this. Verse 26, for through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. It says sons and heirs. Did you hear that? Sons and heirs. Verse 27, for those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. Verse 28, there is no Jew or Greek slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. He said, ain't, ain't no Jew no more. It ain't that, ain't, listen, listen, now I don't mean to in any way take away from the Jews. Right. They are God's chosen people. We right. need to show respect for them. Jesus right. Christ, so don't, don't, don't mistake me right. by in any way trying to take away from the Jews. They are God's right. chosen right. people. Okay. Don't, don't take me there. But what I'm saying is, in the eyes of God, we are one. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible says. It says that we are one. It says in verse 28, there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong, verse 29, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, mm -hmm. heirs mm -hmm. according to... <laughs> The Bible says mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that in Christ Jesus, 
if we are in Christ and belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. Amen. So as far as God is concerned, the same blessings and everything that he promised to Abraham as a Gentile through Christ, if you're in Christ, you receive those promises. Amen. Somebody, I, I say amen on that. Amen. Because I'm not a Jew. And, and, and the, the promise we receive it through Jesus Christ. That, that's the main thing. Through Jesus Christ, our position is, is, is essentially the same as a Jew. We, we receive the same promises that the Jews receive. That's essentially what chapter 3 is saying. And you guys can go back and read chapter 3. I'm summarizing chapter 3 because chapter 3 pretty much says the same thing that we're talking about in chapter 2. The, the main point, and you can go back and read chapter 3, is found in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 3. And it, it, it basically supports the same thing that we're talking about right now, which is why I'm just going to close with this. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, notice what Paul says. He says, now, this was not made known to people in other generations as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. Watch this. So Paul says, this is what I'm telling y'all now. The Jews back then didn't know that. They didn't know this. They didn't know that this was coming. They didn't know that this was God's plan. Mm -hmm. But notice in verse six, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, what is it that they didn't know? In verse 6, he tells you, the Gentiles are co-heirs. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, God, I hope y'all got your Bible. If you don't got your Bible, mm -hmm. you need to turn to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Paul says, they didn't know. Here's what I'm trying to tell you, who you are in Christ. Everything that was given to the Jews, because you are in Christ, you receive yourself. You are blessed and highly favored. All of those same promises you have. He says in verse 6, here's what it is that they didn't know. He says that the Gentiles are co-heirs with the Jews. He says, members of the same body. Mm -hmm. There's only one body in Christ. There's not a Jewish body. There's not a Gentile body. We're all members of the same body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, and partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Hallelujah. So the, the main point there is, which, which is where I'm closing is, is that in Christ, listen, we all have access to the same promise. Right? And so we as Gentiles, listen, somebody, if you're a Gentile or non-Jew, you ought to say, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. Uh, make sure you stay close to him. Because the only access we have to the promises made in the Bible is through Jesus Christ, because you're not a Jew. Mm -hmm. and if you're not a Jew, none of them promises were made to you. They were made to Abraham and his seed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the only mm -hmm. way we receive those promises is through Jesus Christ. So, as we close tonight, listen, uh, please read that. Make sure you finish reading through chapter 2, chapter 3. The end part of chapter 3 is a, is a prayer of Paul, and you can kind of read that. But make sure you start paying attention to chapter 4, because there's a lot of stuff in chapter 4, and we're going to have to slow down and make sure we kind of hit a lot of those points. But the bottom line here, y'all, here is, is that in the church, we are one. There shouldn't be this superiority view in there. Mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. our white brothers and sisters or even from black, black brothers and sisters. So if you're walking around with this, this attitude towards each other, listen, Christ died to take away from that stuff. And oh, he yeah. is our peace. It is Christ that brings us together. It, it is Christ that is our rallying call. We mm -hmm. may not agree on policies, but y'all, we've got to rally around Christ. Amen. And as Amen. If we do, do that, y'all, we'll stick together. And all of this madness, I, I believe a lot of this stuff out there now is demonic. We need to be praying. Mm, we really okay. need to be praying. I, I am concerned. I'm talking to all different types of pastors just praying about eat the attitudes in the church. We mm -hmm. are literally, and, and many people, many good Christian-believing conservatives are literally at times abandoning the principles of the word of God to follow a man. Mm -hmm. And y'all, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we can't have that type of division in the church. I, I encourage you all, don't buy into that stuff. 
don't don't buy into the negativity don't buy into all of that it'll it'll it'll, it'll eat you inside it it'll the, the, the anger will fuel you it'll make you irritable. don't buy into that stuff we need to stay fixated on christ and our brotherhood together with everyone leave all the rest of that stuff to christ listen i'm gonna close there uh I'm, i pray that you have been blessed i want to pray for you all before we leave Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone who is watching now, those who will watch later. I speak your blessings over every person, over their spirit, their soul, and their body. I pray, Lord God, against this virus. I pray for their health, their life, and strength. I pray that you will provide everything that they need. I pray if there's anyone watching me tonight who does not know you as Lord and Savior, that the seed will be planted, Lord God, and that they will come to know you as Lord, that they would reach out, Lord God, and that they would receive you while there is time. I pray your blessings, Lord God, upon anyone here tonight who may be sick or ill, Lord God. I just speak healing. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. There is power in his name. And if you have a sickness or whatever it is, or you need a breakthrough, Father, I just stretch forth my hand in the name of Jesus and just pray that you would bless your people in a way that they would know it is you and that you will receive the glory on. Be with us, Lord God, as we end this, this session tonight. I pray that you would encourage your people to read, study the passages that we did, as well as to prepare for next week as we look in chapter four. We ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, y'all, again, thank you all for joining tonight. Make sure you start reading Ephesians chapter four. There is a lot, y'all, in Ephesians chapter four. So when you start reading that, make sure you start like slowing down, and doing some meditation that we talked about on Sunday, and you'll get a lot.